I'm going to need my Bible, and it's not here, so I must have forgotten it. So let me go and grab that real quick. How's everybody doing this morning? Yeah? That was pretty good for the Northwest. Pretty good. <laughs> Sunday morning, cloudy skies. I take that as that was like cheering. All right, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> Man. Oh. By the way, um, I was watching a a video of myself preaching because my my family had it on. They had missed a Sunday or two, and the kids were watching it, and it was really precious to see. But um, half of my collar was popped up the whole sermon. <laughs> <laughs> and I've never been good about that, so if you see that, you just, you just tell me, okay? You tell me. <laughs> Not that it really matters, but... Uh, well, I can't believe it's already July 28th. I mean, this, this summer is, is flying by. Um, it's just, it's almost August. It's crazy. I mean, before you know it, kids are going to be back in this building, right? Um, and uh, some are going to be taking test. That's going to be the worst part of it all is just having to take a test. I remember, you know, kids can be different on that. Um, I remember how it was for me in the classroom setting. And to be honest, it didn't bother me all that much because tests are just sort of black and white. Either you know your stuff or you don't. But the thing about tests is that they, they never really stop, right? They, they take place outside of the classroom. Kids and traffic jams test our patients Long hours at work test our endurance. Practical issues like cars that quit driving and appliances that, that quit working, they test our ability to solve problems. And wives test our ability to know their favorite coffee drink in the drive through It's a nice shake and espresso, by the way. But one thing we may not think about very often is that the Bible actually says that God tests us. And that can be a little bit confusing because the Bible also says that God won't tempt us in James 1.13. But in reality, testing and tempting are completely different because tempting is what the enemy does to entice us to sin, to try to get us to mess up, to try to get us to stumble. But testing is something God does to help us prove the quality of our faith. The story of Job is a perfect example of that because it shows us both testing and tempting side by side. In chapter 1, right after we, we learned that Job was a wealthy man, that he followed God in the opening verses, starting in, in verse 6 of Job chapter 1. Let's read that. Let's listen to what it says. One day the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord asked Satan, where have you come from? From roaming through the earth, Satan answered him, and walking around on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? No one else on earth is like him, a man of perfect integrity who fears God and turns away from evil. Satan answered the Lord, does, does Job fear God for nothing? Haven't you placed a hedge around him, his household, and everything he owns? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he owns, and he will surely curse you to your face. Very well, the Lord told Satan. Everything he owns is in your power. However, do not lay a hand on Job himself. So Satan left the Lord's presence. Now, as the majority of us already know, as the story continues, Job loses everything he has. He stays faithful to God, and God eventually restores everything back to him with interest. But here's what I want to point out. Here within this window to the spiritual world, we can see two very distinct purposes on behalf of God and Satan about the same course of events. And here's the difference. Satan afflicted Job to tempt him to sin and turn back on the Lord, but God allowed Job to experience that same loss to put his faith to the test. Tempting and testing. So tempting is something the enemy does, and testing is something that God does. And there's a whole lot of scripture to support that. Proverbs 17.3 says, A crucible for silver and a smelter for gold, and the Lord is the tester of hearts. Okay, so a crucible is like a, a, and a smelter are both used to melt silver and gold for the purposes of removing their impurities through fire. So what this actually means, this verse means, is that God tests our hearts through trials 
to remove the stuff that he doesn't want to be there. And that reveals to us the purpose of why God tests us. Then James 1 through 2 through 4 says it another way. It says, Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And then Psalm 66, 10 through 12 just says it flat out. For you, God, tested us. You refined us as silver is refined. You lured us into a trap. You placed burdens on our backs. You let men right over our heads. We went through fire and water, but... You brought us out to, re- to abundance. So really that passage actually shows us another difference between temptation and testing and that they both are designed to produce opposite results. Giving into temptation results in emptiness and distance from God, but enduring a test results in fullness and intimacy with God. That said, my point in sharing those scriptures with you this morning is to show you the biblical evidence behind the fact that God really does test us. And one would think that if we spend time studying and preparing for a test at school, that we would at least consider how to prepare for one of God's tests in our lives. I mean, if we study for a math test, shouldn't we study for one of God's tests? That said, for believers, this isn't pass-fail. The book of Philippians says that God is faithful to complete the work that he began in you. That means that God will hold on to you and won't let you go when he tests you. However, it absolutely is possible to earn a lower grade. I mean, have you ever had a time in your life when God had to hit you over the head with something repeatedly until after a lot of pain and hardship, you finally, finally got it? Yeah, me too. (laughs) And the thing is, that may be one way to get through a test or trial that God wants to use in your life. But it's not the only way. In fact, I'm here to tell you today that there's actually a better way. And it's a lot like using a steady guide. I used to love it when my teachers would give me a steady guide. It wasn't easy, right? Because I knew that, you know, I could memorize the guide, I can, I can ace the test. Well, guess what? Genesis 22 gives us the ideal steady guide to not just merely pass God's tests in our lives, but ace them. So with that, let's get right into verse 1. Again, that's Genesis chapter 22. Verse 1, here's what it says. After these things, after a time of success and good in Abraham's life, that's those things. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, here I am, he answered. Take your son, he said, your only son Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. So Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took with him two of his young men and his son Isaac. He split wood for a burnt offering and set out to go to the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there to worship. Then we'll come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. In his hand, he took the fire and the knife, and the two of them walked on together. It's like some scene from a movie. Then Isaac spoke to his father Abraham and said, My father? And he replied, Here I am, son. Isaac said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Where is it? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Then the two of them walked on together. When they arrived at the place that God had told them about, Abraham built the altar there and, and arranged the wood. He bound his son Isaac and placed him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, he replied, here I am. And he said, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your only son from me. Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering in the place of his son. And Abraham named the place the Lord will provide. So today it is said it will be provided on the Lord's mountain. 
Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn this is the Lord's declaration. Because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will indeed bless you and make your offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your offspring will possess the city gates of their enemies and all the nations of the earth will be blessed by your offspring because you, obeyed my, you have obeyed my command. Abraham went back to his young men, and they got up and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham settled in Beersheba. Now, in reading that incredible story with you this morning, one thing is undeniably clear. When God tested Abraham, he got an A. He didn't get a B, he didn't get a C, he got an A. He stood strong, he obeyed God, even when it scared him to death, and he was willing to do what God asked for, even when it came to the unthinkable. But the question for us students here today is, why? What kept Abraham from telling God no at any given moment, or at least altering what God had said to make it a little bit more palatable? What was the thing that enabled Abraham to score higher than a 90%? Well, it really comes down to just one word, and that word is trust. Listen in, because this is the thing that God is really going to grade you the most on and that's why it's bolded in your study guides this morning. When you take one of God's tests, the amount of trust you place in the teacher will be proportional to the grade you receive. When you take one of God's tests, the amount of trust you place in the teacher will be proportional to the grade you receive. Still, that leaves us with questions about the details because people don't just trust in God or really in anyone for just no reason at all. So the question is, what exactly was it about God that Abraham trusted in that we need to trust in too, for that matter, if we're going to ace our test? Well, that's exactly where we're going to dive into right now. So starting with the first point in your study guide today, trust in God's word. Trust in God's word. Now, you might be wondering what that has to do with Abraham, considering the fact that during his time on earth, the book of Genesis wasn't even around for hundreds of years. I mean, it's not like he just was cracking open a Bible, you know, every Sunday morning with his cup of coffee, you know, for his quiet time. He didn't have a Bible. There was no Bible. However, Abraham did absolutely have God's word. That is God's spoken word. Think about it. The Lord spoke repeatedly through Abraham's life. And when I say repeatedly, I mean repeatedly. And God laid out his initial promise with Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. But after that, he repeated it on five separate occasions. Let's take a look at it. First, in Genesis 12, 2, that's where God made his initial promise that God would make Abraham a new great nation. Later in verse 7, God reappeared to Abraham and told him, To your offspring I will give this land. After that, Genesis 13, 16 says, I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth. And after that, God began to reveal that Isaac would be the one to father all of these descendants. He got more specific. Chapter 15, God told Abraham, One who comes from your own body will be your heir. Then God reappeared to Abraham with an even clearer message, narrowing it down even further about Isaac. Verse 18 says, So Abraham said to God, if, if only Ishmael were acceptable to you. Remember, he had another son, not the son of promise. But God said, No, your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will name him Isaac. I will confirm my covenant with him as a permanent covenant for his future offspring. Then one final time before our passage today in chapter 21, verse 12, God again reestablished the fact that this covenant of blessing would be through Isaac. That's a lot of times. Now, what I want you to get from all of that is that when God asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, Abraham clearly decided to trust in what the Lord had already said about him. Abraham knew that, that if God let Isaac die before he was even married, then he wasn't going to be anybody's father, <laughs> let alone the father of a nation. So when Abraham's test came, he didn't let it shake him because he decided to place his trust in what God had already said. He'd already revealed it in his word. And with that understood, let me ask you a question this morning. How different do you think Abraham's response to God's test would have been if he had ignored what God had already spoken? What if he cast it aside? What if he forgot what God promised him about Isaac? 
Do you think Abraham would have still passed with flying colors? No. Of course not. Do you see where I'm going with this? Listen, there's a bridge extending from the example of Abraham directly into our lives, here and now. And it's right here on this table. Abraham had God's spoken and repeated word. But each and every one of us have access to the entirety of God's written word. We have access to the entirety of God's promises. We have access to the entirety of God's revealed truth. We can even look at a scripture up online and get a search result in the blink of an eye. And the fact of the matter is we have a lot more of God's promises, God's revelation, God's word to trust in than Abraham ever did. So why is it that we still find it so hard to trust God when we're tested? Well, if the problem isn't our access to information, then maybe it's in our choice to trust that God's word is still true. That his promises are still for us. That God is still faithful to be the God he said he is. Because listen, when our lives come crashing down and we're put to the test, our tendency is to question the word of God based upon our situation, not to question the situation based upon the word of God. We think to ourselves, God, I'm in so much pain, so you must not have good plans for me. God, you let them die, so how could you really have power over death? God, I'm so burdened with stress, so there must be no way to find peace in you. But our thinking should be like this instead. God, I know you love me, so there must be a good reason that I can't see for the pain you've allowed me to endure. God, I know you're good, so I'll trust you even though I don't understand why they had to pass away. God, I know you can give me peace, so I'm asking for it, even though I don't know how I'm ever going to receive it. Listen, my point is our tendency is to get it backwards. And the reason is because we want to define reality by what we see and feel with our senses as opposed to what we read in the Bible. And maybe that seems reasonable to us. But church, in reality, it actually makes no sense at all. Listen, Isaiah 40, verse 8, says, The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. What's in the Bible has stayed the same, and it will continue to stay the same, which means the word of God is the constant in the equation of our lives. And if the word of God is the constant, then our individual experiences must be the variables. And mathematically speaking, no one would ever think to rewrite a constant based on a variable. Up there you should see an equation. Very, very easy equation. 2 plus A equals 4. Now, none of us would ever look up there and think, hmm, I feel like A is a 3 today. So, that 2 actually must be a 1. None of us would do that. It, it, it doesn't make any sense. And that's because the constant always defines the variable. We would look up there and we would say 2 plus 2 equals 4. We would look at the constant and the constant would define the variable. In the same way, the variable of our individual experiences must be defined by the constant of God's word and not the other way around. That said, if you want to ace one of God's tests in your lives, you'll have to do what Abraham did and trust in God's word regardless of how it does or doesn't make sense with your circumstances right now. That said, let's keep moving because the second point in your steady guide today is this trust in God's character. Trust in God's character. By character, I mean trust in the person that God has proven himself to be. In Abraham's life, by the time this test began, he already learned several things about God's character. The events of Sodom and Gomorrah showed Abraham that God is just and patient. The events with Pharaoh, Abimelech, and Sarah, and all that mess showed Abraham that God hates deception. The nature of God's calling and his revelation about the judgment of the Ammonites showed Abraham that God was against child sacrifice, idolatry, and the evil customs of the Canaanites. And there was one big lesson that Abraham learned, which was that God is pleased by genuine faith. 
So it goes deeper than just trusting in God's word or his promises and covenants because Abraham also trusted in the person he knew God to be. I mean, just think about it. Abraham's response to God in our text this morning is, is crazy. It's, it's unheard of. Why didn't he at least question God or say, how could you do this, God? I mean, he had certainly asked that before. Remember the fact that in the account of Sodom and Gomorrah that we read just two weeks ago, Abraham was very bold with God and questioned his justice on the spot. He said to God, killing the righteous with the wicked, how could you do such a thing? That was pretty gutsy. So it's not like Abraham was too afraid to question the justice of God here. That said, I believe Abraham's surprising obedience came down to the fact that he never really believed that God's character would allow him to go through with killing his own son in the first place. I mean, I just don't read this story and picture Abraham as hopelessly oblivious or truly believing his son would die at this point. Verse 5 even says, Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there to worship. Then we'll come back to you, both him and Isaac. So, so he said that after they worshiped, they would both come back. That proves that Abraham expected his son to live. But my point is that the reason I believe Abraham expected his son to live is that he knew God's character didn't line up with the assumed result of God's request. In other words, Abraham didn't only trust in what God had promised, but in who God was. Now, I do believe that this particular test was a special circumstance. You know, I don't usually hear about you know, parents feeling like God is asking them to sacrifice their own children these days. I haven't heard very many stories. And that's because I believe God used this text to reveal his hatred for child sacrifice and to point, out, point forward to Christ, which we'll get to in a moment. But the principle of trusting in God's character when you go through a test is a timeless one. That said, when it comes to our own application of this, we need to be careful that our own understanding of God's character is congruent with his word. Otherwise, this can be very dangerous. What I mean is believing God in a, is a certain way just because you would like him to be. Um, that's not good. It's only going to make things worse. Because the truth is that Scripture is what informs us about what is and what is not. God's character. But with that understood, my point is that when we experience one of God's tests, there are certain things about His character that we should trust in. For example, we know from Titus 1 verse 2 that it's not within God's nature to lie. And we also know that God is generous from 2 Corinthians 9, 8 through 15, among other passages. Beyond that, Psalm 103, 8 tells us that the Lord is compassionate, that he is a God of loving kindness. And the thing is that your trust in those things about God matters a lot when you're tested because it will determine whether or not you will cling to God or push him away. And that means that when we experience a test, it's not only important to trust in what God has said, but in who he is. But those aren't the only things you'll need to trust in because if you want to ace one of God's tests, you'll also need to trust in God's provision. Trust in God's provision. The fact that Abraham trusted in God to provide throughout his test is indisputable. In verse 7 of chapter 22, Moses writes, then Isaac spoke to his father Abraham and said, My father, and he replied, Here I am, my son. Isaac said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Then the two of them walked on together. So Abraham trusted God to not only stop the sacrifice, but to provide a substitute in Isaac's place. Then in the New Testament, Hebrews eleven seventeen 17 through 19 gives us even more information about how God, how Abraham trusted God to provide. And here's what it says. Verse 17, by faith, Abram, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. He received the promises and yet he was offering his one and only son to one, the one to whom it had been said, your offspring will be traced through Isaac. He considered God to be able to even raise someone up from the dead. Therefore, he received him back, figuratively speaking. 
So according to the book of Hebrews, Abraham actually thought about the fact that it, even if God did allow him to go through with this thing, this act of killing his son, that God would, could raise him back from the grave. I mean, if that's not trusting in God to provide, then I don't know what is. Abraham had faith, even when he couldn't see. And he trusted in God to provide, even by doing the impossible if necessary. That is amazing. But what we also need to remember is that, in the end, the Lord absolutely did provide. After God stopped Abraham from sacrificing Isaac, verse 13 says this. Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in the thickets by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering in place of his son. And Abraham named that place the Lord will provide. So today it is said it will be provided on the Lord's mountain. Listen, this speaks volumes into our lives here and now because maybe some of you are going through some junk today. Maybe you're caught up in the middle of a situation that you want out of. And I don't know, but I'll just bet that God might even be testing some of you right now. And if that's you, then the question you need to ask yourself is this. Do I really and truly believe that the Lord will provide for me in and through what I'm experiencing? Do I really and truly believe that the Lord will provide for me in and through what I'm experiencing? And listen, this isn't about knowing exactly how the Lord will provide. Because if you knew that, then it wouldn't take any trust. Even Abraham didn't, didn't know exactly how the Lord would provide and what he did think in terms of the resurrection. It didn't even happen. It didn't happen that way. So my point is that you aren't going to no either. In fact, it might be flat out impossible for you to even conceptualize, even think of one way the Lord could provide for you right now and what you're going through. But that just means you're one step closer. Because when you're truly trusting in the Lord to provide, you don't have to see how. In fact, it's better that you don't. You just have to believe He will. And that's the final thing that we can learn from our text today, from the example of Abraham. That said, you never know when God is going to give you a pop quiz. So, let's review our study guide. If you want to ace one of God's tests in your lives, then you're going to need to do three things. First, trust in God's word. Second, trust in God's character. And third, trust in God's provision. And remember, when you take one of God's tests, the amount of trust you place in the teacher will be proportional to the grade you receive. That said, there could be somebody here today who's coming from a completely different place, and, and you don't even know what to think about Jesus. Maybe you're here and you don't even know why. You just sort of wound up sitting down in a seat. Maybe your whole life has been one big test, crisis after crisis. Listen, our story today was meant to point forward to the ultimate story of God's provision when he gave his one and only son to die in our place. Our story this morning was about more than Abraham and Isaac. So there's one thing I want you to remember today, and it's this. Jesus was the ram in the thicket. And you and I are Isaac. The difference is that we actually deserve to die because of our sin before God. Listen, the Bible says that all of us have a sinful nature. It's that nasty stuff within each one of us that makes us do selfish things, hurt other people. Nobody doesn't have that. Ultimately, sin is a direct affront to the holiness and righteousness of God. And the consequence for it is death. And that's why I'm saying that Jesus is like the ram in the thicket. Because God used him to die in our place. His blood covers. His blood forgives. It wipes it all away. He was our substitute. God did pro provide. He did. He did that already. But listen, you have to take the ram. You have to use it. Imagine how weird it would have been if Abraham just stared at the lamb. Oh, there's a lamb. Hmm, okay, here's my son, you know, just holding the knife. Uh, it would be, it wouldn't make any sense at all, but that's exactly what a lot of people do when it comes to Jesus Christ. Oh, there's the lamb. And then you don't do anything. 
But listen, it doesn't have to be that way. And you don't have to be that person this morning. You can decide right now that you're ready to place your trust in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who took away my sin, who took away your sin. There's a way for you to accept his sacrifice. There's a way for you to be saved. And it's by coming to him in prayer and telling him that you believe. So I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. Lord, for anyone in this room who wants to come to you for the first time, who wants to accept you as the ram in the thicket, who wants to take your provision and say, that is mine now. Lord, I, I pray that they would take that moment right now and pray in their hearts that they believe in you, Jesus, that they believe in what you did on the cross, that they believe your sacrifice really is enough to pay for their sin. And your word says that if they do that, that your Holy Spirit will come and dwell in their hearts. And they'll never be the same. And I pray that that one would think about the next step, which is baptism, which is telling people and showing people, hey, I believe. Inviting them in on that celebration. Lord, I thank you for everything you've done today. And I pray that for us, for those of us that are already believers, that we would trust in you completely that we would prepare for a test or maybe we're in one right now and we would use what we've learned from your word um, to not just kind of skate by but to do well and God I pray you'd be with us for the remainder of this service in Jesus name Amen